Well, hey, everyone. It's so good to see you guys here and all those that are online as well. Before we dive into the message, I wanted to report uh, something that happened, a couple things that happened over this past week that maybe you weren't aware of. Uh, but uh, on last Monday, we have a free food market monthly. We do it monthly. And last Monday, we had a home church that serves every month in the free food market, but they decided they wanted to do something a little bit more than just serve in the, free, in the food market. So they decided to give... Uh, financially, and I don't know how much, the, how much it was, but they put it in an envelope and they decided, they prayed about it and they decided we're gonna give this to the 50th car. And so that's what they did. And somebody walked out to the, to the, car, the lines of cars that are here on the, on the food market day and handed this car, it was, a, it was a dad and a teenage daughter. And of course the teenage daughter was like stoked, like free money, this is great. And the dad didn't know what to say. He was so shocked by it. But I just, I, I know who the home church is and they wanted it to be confidential, but I just, can we just give them a high five right now? Can you just, yeah, applaud, it's so great. Way to go. I love it. And not only that, but yesterday we had 30 families, kids, moms and dads come, come here to the church and they created 400 care packages with homemade cards that the kids drew and colored for the Bend and Redmond warming shelters. And those are being delivered this, this next month. And a couple dozen other people dropped off donations for the warming shelters. And I'm just so proud of what our church family is doing uh, in these difficult days and what God is doing through us all. So thank you for that. Well, uh, we are in a series on the Beatitudes, and we've been digging into the teaching of Jesus, um, the Sermon on the Mount, this little portion of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes, and it's upside down. It's so different than what we're, what we're used to and how we typically think about life and about um, this world, and, and it's a map, really. The Beatitudes is kind of a guide to help us live into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter five is where we're gonna start. And I love what Max uh, Lucado says about Matthew five. He says, it describes God's radical reconstruction of the heart. Observe the sequence. First, we recognize we are in need. We're poor in spirit. Next, we repent of our self-sufficiency. We mourn. We quit calling the shots and surrender control to God. We're meek. So grateful are we for his presence that we yearn for more of him. We hunger and thirst. As we grow closer to him, we become more like him. We forgive others. We're merciful. We change our outlook. We're pure in heart. Uh, we love others. We're peacemakers. We endure injustice. We're persecuted. It's no casual shift of attitude. It's a demolition of the old structure and a creation of the new. The more radical the change, the greater the joy. And it's worth every effort for this is the joy of God. So let's dive in. Matthew chapter five, if you got a Bible, you can follow along with me uh, or it'll be up on the screen. Matthew five, verse 10, Jesus says this, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. <laughs> oh, come on. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Did I already say it's upside down? It's upside down. It's, it's different than what we think. It's, he, and, and I love that Jesus begins uh, in verse 3, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for theirs is the kingdom. And he's kind of getting close to the end of the Beatitudes here. And, he, and he's ending with those that are persecuted also are inherit the kingdom of heaven. This whole thing is about God's kingdom. It's about living into his way. It's about inheriting the promises of God. This, Jesus' whole message was about repenting and turning back to the kingdom of heaven, the values, living the values of the kingdom, the ethos of the kingdom. And he ends here with blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what is right. Because eventually, those who live the way of Jesus, as he describes, will be persecuted. Paul, the apostle Paul writes to Timothy years later, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted persecuted. We've enjoyed in the United States the lack of persecution against 
uh, the church, the religious freedom that we enjoy has, has kept a barrier around us in terms of persecution. And, and, and it, yet, I, yet I, as you read the narrative of scripture, you see that, that, that not only was Jesus persecuted, his, his followers were persecuted, but then the early church was persecuted and it's gone on. And even today, I'm gonna share with you persecution that's happening all over the world. But the early church experienced this. Here in the Beatitudes, Jesus actually connects the persecution of the Old Testament prophets to the upcoming persecution that he and his followers were going to experience. And what's distinct about the persecution of the Old Testament prophets as well as what was distinct about the persecution of Jesus and of his first followers is that it almost always came from within. It almost always came from the religious establishment of the day. When you read through the New Testament, you see that the persecution of Jesus and of the apostles began and came from their own people first, the Jewish religious leaders. I'm super fascinated about with church history. Um, you wouldn't know that because I usually keep us out of the historical weeds in messages because I got 25 minutes, you know, you can't spend too much time on history. But it's worth today painting a picture of what it was like for Jesus and those first followers. Do you know the primary reason that Jesus was arrested um, was for the cleansing of the temple. When he went into the temple and, he, and he, there was money changers and he just threw, threw, threw them all out and, and he was angry and he, and, he, and, he, and he was like, you can't do this in God's house. And, and, but, but also he, he, over and over you see Jesus rebuking the religious establishment um, for their hypocrisy, for their lack of love of the poor and the marginalized. And, and then when Jesus was on trial, he confessed before these rulers that he was the son of God. And that was it. That was the straw that broke the back and they got Rome to help them put Jesus to death. Stephen, who's the first Christian martyr, was accused by the Jews of speaking against Moses, against God, against the temple. Stephen actually said that Jesus came to change the customs that Moses delivered. And in his own defense, this is what Stephen said to these religious rulers. God does not dwell in houses made by hands. And then he proceeds to accuse them of killing the prophets and the Messiah, Jesus. At which point they stop the proceedings and stone Stephen to death. The Jews followed Paul, the Apostle Paul, all around, wherever he went, causing him trouble and getting him arrested and beaten. Rome only became the primary persecutors of Christianity after, um, after Nero accused Christians of burning Rome, which ended up, he's the one that burned Rome, but they, he accused the Christians of doing that, and, and, and then Rome began uh, uh, the persecution of Christians. Interestingly, there was only about 12 of the 54 emperors of Rome that actually per persecuted Christians. Sometimes we maybe, maybe we think that it was persecution all the time. It wasn't. Um, but, but those 12 that took any interest in Christians, they were pretty ruthless. Domitian uh, was, the, was the first emperor to kind of proclaim himself a god. He gave himself the title God, the Lord, and he insisted that people worship him. Well, of course, Christians would not do that, and so they were persecuted. They refused to worship the emperor or any of the, other, of the gods of those days, and they didn't participate in pagan rituals. Interesting, because they didn't participate in pagan rituals, they were actually blamed for natural disasters because they weren't sacrificed to the gods. In AD 196, Tertullian, he wrote this, the Christians are to blame for every public disaster and every misfortune that befalls the people. If the Tiber rises to the walls, if the Nile fails to rise and flood the fields, if the sky withholds its rains, if there is earthquake or famine or plague, straight away the cry arises, the Christians to the lions. See, it wasn't just that they weren't allowed to gather. They, many of them were put to death. In AD 107, uh, Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, he was a pupil of John the Baptist, of, of the Apostle John, excuse me, he refused to uh, sacrifice to the gods. And this is what he wrote to another Christian leader, Polycarp, who was also a disciple of John. He wrote, let the fire, the gallows, the wild beasts, the breaking of bones, the pulling asunder of members, 
the bruising of my whole body, and the torments of the devil and hell itself come upon me so that I may win Christ Jesus. The early church suffered because of their faith in Christ. But today there are Christians all over the world who also suffer. According to Open Doors, which is an organization that's been tracking Christian persecution for many years, they reported that one in eight Christians today around the world are discriminated against because they follow Jesus. In China, I was watching a video, in China they, 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 they've put facial recognition cameras in the, in, all over the sanctuaries to, to, to identify who's going to church and track their movement, their activities. 340 million Christians live in places where they are persecuted and discriminated against because of their faith. You know, a couple decades ago, um, it'd be hard to imagine something like all of this happening in the United States. A country where most of us grew up with some version of a Christian worldview. It's hard to imagine, it would be hard to imagine. But more and more, Christ, but more and more I think Christianity is seen as a hate group. Not because of the majority of Christians who live generous, kind, loving lives, but because of the extremists that we see holding signs that say God hates fags, who blow up abortion clinics, who march on Washington armed. It's a minority, but it's a loud one. And so today, it's not hard for me to see how our world could view Christianity as they did during Nero's day, odium, generis humani, haters of the human race. So what do we do? This is a heavy message because I genuinely believe Jesus' words that those who follow his way will indeed be persecuted. They will experience these things, and I think we will experience these things in our day. And so how do we as Christ followers respond to the persecution that we will one day experience as faithful followers of Jesus? Thankfully, Jesus actually taught us how to respond to persecution. And by the way, I think there's a lot of debate going on right now in churches about what is and what isn't persecution in the United States, um, that the gover governments don't allow churches to gather in mass, uh, to have businesses are been, have been closed, schools have been closed, uh, you know, concerts can't be held, all of that stuff, but, but the church is being persecuted. So there's a lot of debate about that right now. And, um, and what's, what I, what I, what's interesting to me is I studied this Regardless of whether you think the persecution is real or perceived, our response is the same. It's the same. We don't, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't matter if, you, if persecution is happening or not happening or what your view is on that. The way Jesus teaches us about how we respond in the midst of persecution, real or perceived, is the same. And so I want us to dig, I want us to spend a few minutes talking about how do we respond in that, whether you think it's happening now or not, or whether you, dis maybe you disagree with me that it's not going to happen. I'd rather prepare us for that day, whether or not it happens or not, right? That we could live into the way of Jesus with integrity when persecution comes. And so uh, in the same teaching that Jesus gave these beatitudes, just a, uh, a, few, a few verses later, same day, same mountain, same time frame, Jesus says, teaches this. He said this, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as two children of your father in heaven. Do you see how the way of Jesus is different than any other way, even the American way, when it comes to persecution? For many of us, American Christians, our natural response when we're faced with any type of persecution, whether it's religious or just our national freedoms or whatever, is to stand up against it. That's the American way. It's, it's to fight, it's to legislate, it's to protest. We're Americans. Gosh darn it. That's what we're, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Most followers of Jesus, I think most in the room here, most that are watching online, they would agree that we should live like Jesus. Yes? 
We should act like Jesus, yes? We should love like Jesus, right? And he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Whatever excuse that we have as a Christian or even as a Christian American to not live like Jesus is simply just an excuse to do what we want rather than what he requires. I was talking with a pastor months, uh, months ago about the season that we're living in and what, what, how we should as pastors respond to the, the restrictions that we've all been faced with and and what I told this pastor, I'm going to tell you today, is that eventually the way of Jesus will come against every other way, even the way that we were raised in this country. It just will. You can't read through the Beatitudes and not realize that, that it's going to come against how we, how we grew up and how we think about the world and how we, how, how we process as Americans. It's just gonna come up against that. And if it doesn't, you're not following Jesus. See, I, I do believe that one day we will, we will be persecuted here in the United States as followers of Jesus because we're followers of Jesus. I believe we'll be persecuted both by those within the Christian religious system and also by our government. But I refuse to be persecuted because of the way I am. Because of my anger or my frustration or my, my response. I want it to be because of the way Jesus is working in my life. We cannot give people a reason to persecute the church by the way we don't love or by the way we shout and fight, by the way we don't represent Jesus. We cannot give this world a reason to persecute the church other than the love, the radical, extravagant love of Jesus. See, if we're going to be persecuted, let it be because we are humble because we hunger and thirst for God's justice here and now, because we show mercy to those who don't deserve it, because we insist on our own purity of heart, because we work for peace in this world, let it be for his reasons, not ours. The apostle Peter wrote to the, church, uh, to the churches of his day in 1 Peter chapter two, verse 20, I love this. He's talking a lot about persecution in his, in his letters. And he says, of, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. <laughs> you don't get any credit for that. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. If you suffer for doing good, one theologian wrote, we are not to seek persecution. We are not to provoke it by strange sentiments or conduct or by violating the laws of civil society or by modes of speech that are unnecessarily offensive to others. But if in the honest effort to be Christians and to live the life of Christians, others persecute and revile us, we are to consider this a blessing. Peter goes on to write in chapter three of his letter, first, of his first letter in verse 13. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? I mean, right? Think about that. Who, who would want to harm you for doing good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, worship Jesus as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better 
to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Persecution that I think is inevitable in the life of a follower of Jesus connects us deeply to the kingdom of heaven, more deeply, I think, than anything else we've looked at so far in the Beatitudes. Because we're willing to suffer for doing what is right. We're willing to suffer for his name. There's something deep in that. And if what Jesus said is true, that all who live a godly life will eventually be persecuted, let's not be surprised or angry or mad when we experience hostility and ill treatment because of our religious beliefs. Somehow, Jesus says that happy are those who are persecuted. I think he's crazy. Seriously, I, I think that's, it's a high bar. What's going on with that? And I'm gonna talk more about this in our daily devotions tomorrow about how does he expect us to rejoice? And as you look at the, at the early church and you read through scripture and you, you hear them talking about what, what, what it was like for them to suffer with Christ, that's the language they use, that they suffer with Christ, that they lay down their lives for Christ, that, that they, want to, they want to find Christ in, even in their suffering. This is something that, that, that as, as, as someone who grew up in this country and I never experienced real persecution, it's, it's, it's for to think that I could actually look forward to it. Not, I, I'm certainly not going to welcome it and, and you know, bring it on. I'm not going to do that. But how did the early church welcome persecution? Paul gives us a little hint in Philippians. says about Jesus, yet for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and suffered the shame. What, what, what was the joy set before him? That one day, soon, Jesus would be back with his father in heaven. Jesus promised his disciples that, that he, went, he was gonna go and prepare a place for them so that they could be with him forever. And the early church has this focus on the eternal in everything that they did. They knew that this life was temporary, especially if you were a follower of Jesus. And they knew that, that the, but, and they also knew that this life wasn't all there was. And they looked forward to the day when they would be again with Jesus. We do everything we can in America to try to push death off. I mean, we've got pills you can take. We've got things that you can do. We've got, I mean, we're still trying to find the water you can drink to just live, live just a little bit longer. We try to keep death at bay. We don't even know how to talk about it. We don't even know how to process it. And, and it, something about this early church, they welcomed it because they knew that this life isn't all there is in the kingdom of heaven, both here and now, but also then and there was theirs because of their faith in Jesus. Because this life is only a small part of our story. Because life in Jesus is counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense that we might lose our life here, but we gain eternal life there. And if we lose sight that the kingdom of God is both here and now and then and there, we will not be able to endure when persecution comes. We must be able to see beyond the horizon to that day when there's no more tears or suffering or death or despair. All of us, I think, long for the sunrise of a new day and the sunset of a hard one. We long for the presence of Jesus in this life and the hope of him in the next. And amidst our persecution, ours is the kingdom. So there's nothing to fear. Even when persecution comes, we can be of good cheer for he has overcome this world. Let's pray. 
Jesus, we need you. We need you. It's so hard to live this life without your presence in us. Thank you, Jesus, that you promised to send us a helper, a paraclete, the Holy Spirit to walk with us and to be in us. Thank you that we, because you sent him, we have the power to walk even through suffering and persecution with integrity and with faith and with love and with grace and with mercy. That Jesus, you would fill every single person that is listening to this right now, you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit and give them the strength to endure, the strength to walk through whatever suffering they might be experiencing now, whether it's just because of life or it's because of their faith. Jesus, I pray that you'd give them strength and endurance and be able to walk this path to its completion. And help us, Jesus, to be of good cheer. Help us to be people who have a sense of contentment and fulfillment, whether life is great or whether life is hard. Help us to be people who walk according to your will and your purposes in this world. And Lord, help us to respond to our neighbors, our friends, our family, those we work with, with the love, grace, and mercy that you taught us to live. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us and uh, hope you can discuss this more deeply in community. Uh, We have some questions, whether you're in our home church or you're talking about this with some friends. Um, Here they are. Have a great week.